leadership. That pigeons you could have done for another race is a leadership that will increase. Yeah. Any leadership that pigeons you could depend upon another race is a leadership that will increase. They yeah. gave leadership to our four parents and that leadership made them safe. Uh, yeah. But we have decided to find a leadership of our own to make ourselves free men. Yeah. Our great scholars have passed through the colleges the universities have thrown away the blessed record. Babylon did it. Assyria did it. France under Napoleon did it. Germany under Prince von Bismarck did it. England under America under George Washington did it. Africa with 400 million black people can do it. If you cannot do it, if you are not prepared to do it, then you will die. You race of cowards. You race of imbeciles. You race of good for nothing. If you cannot do what other men have done, what other nations have done, what other races have done, then you have to die. Peace and love, family. Welcome to this edition of Garveyism Mercies. I greet you in the words of peace, hotep, shalom, assalamu alaikum, alafia, and as always, race first. Here in this edition of Garveyism Verses, we'll be talking about UNIA versus BGLO, Garveyism versus Creek Life. The tale of the tape. What is the UNIA? What is a BGLO? The UNIA, you see, is a Pan-African group. The BGLO is Pan-Hellenic. The UNIA was started in 1914, BGLO 1904. You can see the founders, the original founders of the UNIA here, and the original founders of the first BGLO, which we can get into in a minute. And here's the reason why the UNIA was formed, and here's the reason why the first BGLO was BGLO stands for Black Greek Letter Organization. So the oldest Black Greek Letter Organization is Sigma Pi Phi, or the Grand Boulet. You see the logo here in the top right corner. Sigma Pi Phi was formed in 1904 in Philadelphia. And Henry McKee Minton, one of its founders, mentioned that he wanted to create an organization which would partake, in his own words, of the tenets of Skull and Bones at Yale and Phi Beta Kappa. Skull and Bones is also known as the Order, Order 322, or the Brotherhood of Death. It's one of the big three societies at Yale, the other two being the Scroll and Key and Wolfhead Society. Phi Beta Kappa, you see, is mentioned there as well is the oldest academic honor society in the United States and is often described as its most prestigious one. So you see there's a distinction between academic fraternities or honor societies and other, all right? These are the original divine nine of what we know of the BGLOs, um, the academic fraternities, all right? The Grand Boulet or Sigma Pi Phi fraternity was the first now, mind you, that's not an academic fraternity. However, these were the original divine nine. You see the four male and the four female black fraternity or black Greek letter organization. They formed the National Pan-Hellenic Council in 1930. And these were the groups that were a part of that. All right, moving forward. So this brings us to why we're here today. White Greeks are calling for an end to Greek life due to racism, oppressive practices, injustices, and unfair post-grad advantage. So if that's the case, why aren't BGLO saying something about this? We see here, there's a petition on change.org right now called Abolish Greek Life. Uh, Penn State, uh, Stanford, Vanderbilt, Okay, it's all over the country now. Mind you, if you pay attention here, you see that all of these articles are happening in 2020. All right. Students aren't just leaving Greek life. They want to end it. So this is what's happening right now. There's a call to end Greek life by the white Greek fraternities and sororities. 
due to racism, see here, and insensitivity, and unfair post-grad advantages moving forward. Again, here we are, the white Greek fraternity speaking on the left here. Dismantling the Greek system is probably unfeasible. If you look over here to this circle here, you see students are calling for an end to Greek life. And that goes against some colleges' financial interests. Interesting. Moving forward, this circle here, we see elitist domain. Breaking up the elitist domain fraternity and sorority communities represent is the right thing to do. Despite the potential for controversy, some colleges have already begun to cut the mixer to senator pipeline. Now, what is a mixer? A mixer is all those frat parties you keep seeing. All the movies where you see them getting drunk and wasted, the beer keg parties and all that other stuff, keg stand and all that, to senate pipeline. Go straight from those to the pipeline. Just by affiliation. Moving on, you see over here, Brother Ali Chambers says he believes that black fraternities are actually harmful to black culture in the U.S. Now more than a century old, black Greek letter organizations, fraternities or sororities, have more than 800,000 members. But are such organizations an asset or do they work against African-American culture? He argues that rather than unifying the black community against the effects of racial prejudice, they have merely become a vehicle for blacks to assimilate into white culture and society and a means to create a self-perpetuating black oligarchy. Now we know oligarchy, we just did a, a government class just recently where we talked about the oligarchy of Greece, where it's the aristocrats or the elites the small group of few that rule the many. There you go again, the elitist domain. All right. And deleting that is the right thing to do. Moving forward. So we see here, these are for uh, flyers that were put out by several fraternities and sororities. And they mentioned the fact that there is an elitist group because 85% of all black doctors, 80% of all black judges, 75% of all black PhDs, 50% of all black attorneys come from HBCU. And you see at the bottom right corner of each one of these identical flyers, there's a, a fraternity or sorority name there. So we know that majority of the uh, judges, doctors, lawyers, et cetera, most likely are part of fraternities and sororities when on campus moving forward. Here's the Boule Journal. From what year? This summer, 2020. The Boule again is Sigma Pi Phi, the oldest black Greek letter organization. And we see snippets from the article from this summer number two's journal. And they say, in summary, if we expect to see justice for George Floyd, Rayshard Brooks, and so many other black men and women who were victims of police brutality, we are chasing false hope. Over here to the right, you see, why are police allowed to kill people? This is a cover story, right? Police officers kill people while policing and are seldom prosecuted. So the question is, do these people know? Like these are the lawyers and judges now. Remember, lawyers, judges, federal judges, all right? Attorneys, business executives, okay? Reading these documents, you see that they understand the situation that we are in because they're writing about it. These, these are just headlines from the same article. And uh, if you notice, we just did a recent class about qualified immunity, so-called law language, et cetera. And qualified immunity is a legal principle that grants government officials performing discretionary functions immunity from civil suits, unless the plaintiff shows that the official violated clearly established statutory or constitutional rights of which a person wouldn't have known. Now, when we did this class before, we spoke about the fact that qualified immunity is a way that they get away with killing us all the time because they use these codified languages to use the system moving forward. We know that we are three times more likely to be killed by police. Still, these numbers come from 2019, okay? 
And it struck me as odd that there's a book out called The Fraternity, speaking about lawyers and judges in collusion. And you see here, uh, John Fitzgerald Malloy, who was a judge for a lawyer and a judge for half a century, mentioned how the uh, lawyers and judges profit from our legal system. And he saw how it's been altered in favor of lawyers to the detriment of society. Moving down, we talk about that elitist group again. The power of the fraternity now exercises, including the power to decide President Bush over Gore, if any of you remember those uh, conversations. Worshiping the Constitution in ways the founders did not intend, with lawyers and judges, the priests of that new religion. And we see again here talking about the school to prison pipeline. If we remember back in this other one here, they were talking about the mixer to Senate pipeline. So all of these pipelines are created by these groups that are in collusion. You see the word there. All right. So we know, and it called the fraternity, which is just weird. It just struck me as odd. So moving forward, we know that, remember we said that the, uh, the first BGLO wanted to be in the tenets of skull and bones. We know that skull and crossbones is Masonic at its core, and it also goes back further than colonial America. Moving on, in seeking to become a Freemason, Prince Hall assumed that Black Americans would benefit from the blessings of liberty promised in revolutionary rhetoric. So during the Revolutionary War, everybody's supposed to be brotherhood of man, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what does it say there? Not so. For when he applied, well, he and 14 other free Black men applied in 1775 to the Boston Masonic Lodge for membership, they were refused. They successfully gained charters from the Grand Lodge of Ireland and later the Grand Lodge of England. Okay, here are the symbols over here. This was the first one that they tried to uh, gain membership to. They were rejected. And you see, uh, the Grand Lodge of England gave them the African Lodge number 459 uh, under the Duke of Cumberland, keyword under. Now, looking at this image in the middle here, you see at the very top, it says Knights Templar. And it gives you a couple of different breakdowns of different Masonic and secret society names. Off in the distance there, you see industry, you see business. You see the word there that says, tell them we're rising becoming an Eastern star. We know that uh, Prince Hall Masons, their wives, granddaughters, sisters, uh, daughters, etc., mothers, would then become an Eastern star, right? So this is the women version. And you see it opens in women of any race. It's not just a specific thing. Prince Hall Masons were specifically a black organization. However, black Eastern stars are a part of one larger organization. And here you see a breakdown of all of these different Masonic groups. This image here, you can Google, you can find it, it's easy to find. Um, I only brought it up here so we can see the different things uh, going on. We talk about the Scottish Rite, New York Rite, and the Grand Lodge of England, et cetera, et cetera. Where these things are, what they mean, what are we talking about here? Okay, it says the York Rite, more correctly, is the American Rite and is based on the early mem remnants of craft masonry. Unlike the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite, Scottish Rite, which claims to hold the power of conferring the first three degrees of Masonry, in addition to those under its jurisdiction, those found in the York Rite have rightfully acknowledged that they are considered appended to those of the ancient craft Masonry. So basically, all of that is just saying that the York Rite or the American Rite, right, is under the Scottish Rite. Let's zoom in real quick, take a closer look what we're seeing here. Now on the inside here, you notice, it's, well, first of all, you see it's two sets of stairs. One is obviously the Scottish Rite, the other is the York Rite. But under the stairs, this is a whole separate society within a society. Uh, and as you can see, there's the urn and there's something in the urn. Now, we've always talked about the circle within the circle as being part of that pursuit. Someone else looks at this, that's the 360 degrees of knowledge inside the urn is I would say that this symbol 
represents the sun. That's how we represent the sun. It was a circle with a dot in the middle. Now, right off the top of my mind, I would say that represents the sun. And the sun is definitely bringing 360 degrees of life on this planet. Yeah. Here at the top of that platform, you see Shriners with the bez on, right? The shrine. This lady here is representing the daughter of, daughters of the Nile. I remember when my daughter was younger, there was a group that was going around the city talking about the Rainbow Girls. Here they are here. Here's the Order of the Eastern Star. All right. Here are the Tall Cedars of Lebanon. That will be a different discussion for another day. And here you see the Order of Demole, of which Bill Clinton is a member. So when we talk about the elite, uh, the elite system that creates uh, presidents and judges, et cetera, et cetera, this is what we're talking about, okay? One other thing, we want to notice that the Knights Templar are here at the top of the York Rite. Interesting. Moving forward. Again, we're talking about the elitist domain, all right? The mixer to Senate pipeline. Again, we got here Bill Clinton down here. It actually looks like him too, which is crazy. Moving forward. Dr. Steve Coakley gave an excellent lecture, and we'll have the link to that lecture in the description below, where he gives um, a breakdown of the boule. The word boule is derived from ancient Greek, originally referring to a council of nobles advising a king. We will get back to that in a second. The importance to steal the black professional away from Garvey was because an Afrocentric organization that articulated and captured the black professional would give whites no safe haven in the black community. So the boule was necessary to build up a group who had an investment in protecting the white system as produced by whites having stolen this land. Mind you, this is post reconstruction. Because you're going to sit up in 1904, just got your ass whipped in reconstruction, <laughs> just had Africa divided up before your very eyes, <laughs> colonialized up the butt just after the fake emancipation, <laughs> civil war, slavery, some still in slavery. You can't pee in a white toilet. You can't eat in a white restaurant. This is fucking 54 years before Rosa Parks. <laughs> <laughs> you understand what we at, what period we in? Right. We talking about you got to lean way over to go Greek. <laughs> right. There ain't even no radio or TV yet, so somebody had to tell you about them. You couldn't even read about them. You couldn't see nothing about them or hear nothing about them. There was no TV and no radio in 1904. So when you're talking about you're going to set yourself up like tenants of Skull and Bones at Yale, you better believe somebody in around this boule, and we're checking on this history of Minton, may have been a Skull and Bones at Yale as damn self. Okay. Post-Reconstruction. We're trying to become, what do we say, advisors to a king. All right. And we see during that same period, the founding of the boule, the founding of eight college-based fraternities and sororities, we also find the um, founding of the NAACP and Urban League. All right? And this is when we start hearing the push of the talented tent. Du Bois. W.B. Du Bois was the founding member of the New York chapter in 1911. The concept of the talented tent developed at a speech that he gave on behalf of the Boule, which was that the Boule represented the elite of the black elite, the college trained man. There was no other black man of influence than this emerging college-educated black man. And so this college-educated black man uh, was, uh, was uh, put in or used by uh, a lot of other people. Uh, W.B. Du Bois uh, took it upon himself. And uh, in the lecture on uh, black-Jewish relations, Africa 93, uh, we talked about uh, W.B. Uh, du Bois' the role uh, in attacking Marcus Garvey. Well, it was deeper than we ever thought. We found out that the Harlem Renaissance, in fact, in fact, was a distraction established by Jewish philanthropy to deter Africans from back to Africa to get involved in poetry, art, science, uh, music uh, as a distraction and a diversion from the goals and aspirations of Marcus Garvey. Du Bois, along with the first black Rhodes Scholar, Elaine Locke, who was 1908 to 1910, there was not another Rhodes Scholar till 1963, that Elaine Locke, 
I was a part with Du Bois of humiliating Marcus Garvey by calling them names like Gorilla, Dark, Dumb Masses, and they hedged their bet. We have found documentation where Du Bois and Elaine Locke had stated clearly that we hope this white man delivers because we've crushed a great black thing. But we know the white man will be delivered or our people will attack us and plague us forevermore. You didn't know that they played and hedged their bet that Marcus Garvey was wrong about the white man. Marcus Garvey was not wrong about the white man. And by never telling you who they are, you can never hold them responsible for the bet they made when they put the money to win on the white man. Which means that Malcolm, we know, knew of these men. We know Marcus Garvey knew of these men because their crowning most outstanding achievement was the physical elimination and castigation of Marcus Garvey and the insistence and the climate setting that brought about the death of Malcolm X. For both of those men, international in perspective and insight were a threat to the very whites that they're sworn to protect. You don't get killed for any other reason than jeopardizing the whites of the whites that run the world. Martin King, who was a boule, met the bullet, not for the civil rights thing, but for the international war thing that got two Kennedy boys killed also. Moving forward. So let's deal with the advisors to the king. Again, uh, Steve Coakley gives an excellent breakdown on this, so we're not going to go too much through it, but we're just going to look at a couple of things. The focus being on the round table or the table round, okay? The fact that it lived only in poetic life and history, but it can live again in real life, and it can live again through us. This is Brother Charles Wesley. He wrote all the history books of all the Black Greek, early Black Greek organisms, all right? But here to the right is the tree of the Knights of the Round Table that uh, Baba Steve Coakley has in the video. I wanted to make sure I got it so we can get a clearer view of it, where he points out there's actually nine people sitting at that table. You see the one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and then King Arthur at the top, right? Okay, so who is this king that he's talking about? Are they talking about King Arthur? But maybe, well, that's not Greek though, so we gotta go back a little bit further. So, what Greek kings do we have here? The last semi mythical, mind you, king of Athens was Codrus. All right. Now, his son was called the first archon of Athens. Now, we know that the Sigma Pi Phi members are all called archons, grand archons, et cetera, et cetera, given the same titles that ancient Greece gave their leadership. But Medon was the son of Codrus. He was the first archon. So I believe if we go back far enough, this is the king that we may be speaking of. Also, here you see Solon the lawgiver. You see an image there of him demanding to, to pledge for his laws. Now, pledging, where have we heard that term? Before? Anyway, move on. Okay, here to the right. And let's basically, this is a whole lot of words saying that King Arthur may not really have been a real person. You see, it says here, an irresistible blend of myth and fact. And everybody sort of has their own version of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Tale. However, we do know that the Knights Templar was a real thing. We do know that they were part of the uh, Inquisition and the Reconquista. We do know that they entered into uh, Ethiopia Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But that's not the point of this lecture today. So these are the original Divine Nine. You see this image here is of the color image of that same picture that Balasi Kofi had, and it is we got it next to the original Divine Nine of the fraternities and sororities. Like I said, every time you watch one of my videos, you're going to want the pause button on ready. Now, how do we call these the original Divine Nine? Well, we know that Iota Phi Theta is one of the Divine Nine. They weren't established until 1963, and they actually weren't a part of the uh, National Panhellenic Council until 1996. So, uh, according uh, as far as the originals 
and the divine nine, uh, that's not relevant to this discussion. So is there such a thing as the African Center Fraternal Life? Yes, there is. Matter of fact, we have the Malik Fraternity and the Malikas Fraternity. The Malikas actually started here in Buffalo. I say, all right? And their purposes you see stated there clearly. All right, moving forward. My question here is if white Greeks are calling for an end to Greek life due to racism, oppressive practices, injustice, and unfair post-grad advantages, BGLO family, why aren't you? Prodigy Woodson, years after being a boule, wrote a book, The Miseducation of the Negro. Years after having been used in the founding member of the DC boule in 1908, Knew the education. See, these were college. The key to all of these men were college education. So when he saw it and saw what had happened to him, he said we were miseducated by the damn thing. It was a it was a fix. And that was having coming to expose something that he had been. Du Bois, years after been left to dry by the boule, left to dry by the NAACP whose leader, Joel Spingard, and his mentor had been a spy for military intelligence, which came out in the Memphis Commercial Appeal story, that, that showed that Du Bois, too, years later, sought to repent for what he had done. But he never exposed the boule. He only personally felt humiliated for having bet wrong. And that's why we had to know that they made a bet, that there was an organized cross out. The race problem will be solved through higher education, through better education, and black and white will come together, that they will never happen until Africa is redeemed. Because if those who like W.E.B. the Boy believe that the race problem will be solved in America through higher education, they will walk between now and eternity and never see the problem solved. <laughs> Somebody get mad and throw their rings back and shit and reveal all the secrets. 